glad you're here this morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'll use this one. I'll use this one. Can we thank God for the worship team as well? Can we thank God for the worship team as well? There we go. There we go. As I'm getting this untangled, praise God. How many people had a great Thanksgiving this year? Amen. Very grateful. I'll leave this here. I don't think I need in ears for this part, but God is so good. If you are new here to Risen Life Church, welcome. As you can tell, we are absolutely in love with Jesus Christ. Absolutely in love with the opportunity. Do you all know that it's a privilege to worship God? There are some people right now on the earth that wish they had the lung capacity to lift up a praise to God and just tell him how grateful he's been. That I love the song that we were singing there at the very end, singing that God is faithful. And I think it's so powerful because each of us come in with different things this morning. That there are certain things in your life and in my life that as you're singing about the faithfulness of God, that the enemy and just the reality of this broken world may be trying to point out some things and say, well, you're saying that God is faithful, but there are still some things that you're waiting on. Anyone waiting on some things this morning? Well, I love the opportunity that I have to worship God and say, God, you are faithful, and I thank you for that, even with some things that you haven't answered yet. Because it's an opportunity to say that, God, my thankfulness is not contingent on what you do for me. And so I love the opportunity that we have to to sing that song. And I'm going to go straight into the message this morning. We're going to go straight in. Y'all know we got our annual meeting, Vision Day, 1210, after service. We're going to have food for it. Thanks. I did the announcement, right? Check. Did it. All right. If you got your Bibles, let's go straight to the Word of God this morning. I want to go to... um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to go to the New Testament. And we've been in a series the last couple weeks called Activate. And yet we're going to press pause this week. And I want to bring us to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to communicate a word to all of us here that I believe is a, it's a prophetic word that the Lord's been speaking into my heart. And as all of us, we celebrated Uh, Thanksgiving this week. It was a time that I pray you were able to spend time with family, loved ones. For those of you that joined us at our house Thursday night, it was awesome just being able to uh, be thankful for the relationships that God has given us. And in that time of Thanksgiving, I want to go to a passage in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Thessalonica. And I want to read three short verses for us, and then we're going to dive in this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. A couple of the shortest verses in the Bible. Doesn't need a lot of words. Verse 16, Paul says this to the church in Thessalonica. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read it again. Paul says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Someone say, all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want to speak from a title this morning, The Supernatural Power of Giving Thanks. The Supernatural Power of Giving Thanks. Even though we are pressing pause on our series called Activate, I believe that this is a message that God has been revealing to me, and he's been trying to train me in learning how to wield the spiritual weapons that I need for our spiritual battle. How many people here know that we are in a spiritual battle every single day? Right now, the enemy has been trying to to take away some of your, your, your hope and your faith in God, and we are in a spiritual battle. And as Paul wrote to this, these churches in Thessalonica, these were churches that Paul actually helped start. During his second missionary journey, he went through the, the, the city of Thessalonica, 
and they started these churches. And then Paul continued on, and he heard about all of the, all of the persecution that was going on with, with the believers here. And when I say persecution, I'm not talking about it was snowing outside. I'm saying that they were being killed. They were being sawed in half. They were being taken away from their families taken away from the market, taken away from access for their families, for goods, all because of saying that Jesus is Lord. And so as Paul writes to this church in Thessalonica, he's, 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 he was worried about what was going on, and then the Bible says that he sent Timothy to go and to check on them, and Timothy finds that they're actually thriving underneath persecution. And so Paul then writes a letter to them, encouraging them, really thanking God for them in their uh, suffering and their persecution. And then the Apostle Paul writes and ends this letter with three commands that are really um, unbelievable to me as they're suffering. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, and if that's not enough, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The thing that the Holy Spirit's been showing me is that giving thanks is one of the most powerful spiritual weapons that we have. Giving thanks is actually a key strategy that God uses throughout Scripture, right? We go all the way back to Joshua with the battle of Jericho. What happened is that they they walked around the walls of Jericho for seven days, and then they did what? They blew trumpets, and the walls came down. Just a couple weeks ago with Gideon, right, in the book of Judges, it says that Gideon gave them torches and trumpets, and that, and last week we talked about, this is how I fight my battles, In other words, praise is a theme throughout Scripture that God uses to fight the supernatural battle. And I believe that God wants to give us some insight onto some of the ways that you can more effectively fight the spiritual fight that you're fighting. And so Paul tells us, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Now this week, I'm sure a lot of us were thankful for a lot of things, right? You get the list of things, your gratitude journal, and say, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for this, and all, that's really important. It's a really important thing to be able to do. But what tends to happen for a lot of us, I'll just say for myself, is the Lord showed me that while there are kind of a, a package of things that I'm thankful for in my life, that I thank God for, whether it's the job, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a, you know, promotion, whether it's a house, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, But there are a group of things in my life that I'm not thankful for. A group of things in my life that I'm struggling with. Maybe it's a loss or a disappointment. I thought I was going to be somewhere, but I'm not. That I thought that this relationship was going to work out, but it's not. I thought I wasn't going to be struggling with mental health anymore, but I still am. I thought the relationship was going to be mended, but it's still not. It's actually getting worse. I thought the child was going to get better because I prayed for them, but it's actually getting worse. That, I, that I'm, I'm struggling at my job with my coworkers with purpose. Whatever, we all have that bucket of things that we're petitioning God for, but thankfulness has not touched that area of our life. And yet Paul said, give thanks in what? All circumstances. And so God is calling us to give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will. There are so many people that say, well, I just want to know the will that God has for my life. It's right in the Bible. It's three verses. It's like the most minimal amount of words we can get. It's very clear. You don't need to interpret this a whole lot. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. That is the will of God in your life through Christ Jesus. And yet Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Now it's important before we dive into this, Paul is not saying give thanks for all circumstances, right? That that there is evil in this world. There is brokenness and there is disappointment and loss and confusion. And there are things in this world that God's not saying be thankful for it, but he's saying be thankful in it. That's why it's important when we sing that song is that I'm declaring, God, great is your faithfulness, even though there's all of these things going on in my life. And God said, if you would take the spirit of thankfulness and the weapon of thankfulness, and you would immerse those things in your life with thankfulness and with gratitude, you will see things turn around. And so I want to talk about three things today 
that giving thanks does. We're talking about the supernatural power of giving thanks. First scripture I want to go to is Psalm, Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. I want to read this and then I'm going to give our first point. Psalm 100, verse 4 through 5, the psalmist writes this. Enter his gates, him being God, enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So the psalmist says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The very first thing that, pray, that giving thanks does is giving thanks gives us access to God's presence. Giving thanks gives us increased access to God's presence. The psalmist was writing this in the Old Covenant. And at that point in the Old Covenant, the Spirit of God would rest on certain places. This happened with the tabernacle. This happened with the temple. This is where the Spirit of God would rest. And so when the psalmist is writing this, he's saying enter into his gates. His gates are, are talking about his presence. That you would go into the holy of holies. You'd enter into the presence of God. And the psalmist is saying that the destination is the presence of God. Did you know that the purpose of everything that we do right now today, it's all about the presence of God. I, I'm thankful that our, our worship team is talented. I don't really care if you're talented though. I care about if we can enter into the presence of God. There are some people that are super talented at music and singing and it's like, oh my gosh, that's such a beautiful voice. But they're doing it not unto the Lord and I'm like, there's no presence here. I can listen to a lot of people that, say, that sing amazing, that aren't singing anything good though, and be like, wow, that is an amazing voice. But there's a difference between entering into the presence of God. I would actually argue that, and some scholars have said this, that if you could like summarize the entire narrative of the Bible in one sentence, it is God reestablishing his presence with his people. That's what God did. Ever since the garden in Genesis chapter 3, what happened is we were separated from the presence of God. And then God created this system of sacrifices and all of these different things. He gave them the commandments, not as restrictions, but actually as invitations into the presence of God. That the commandments and the, the, the laws and the rules, they weren't, they weren't just to restrict you. See, a lot of us, we think that, oh, following God, it makes me, you know, not be able to do the things that I want to do. But everything that God gives us, any restriction that God gives us is actually an invitation into the fullness of life. The Bible says this in Psalm 22. It says that, 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 that God inhabits the praises of his people. That when we praise God, when we give him thanksgiving, that he inhabits those praises. And then also in, in Psalm 16, it says that in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. That's what God's been showing me as he said, Chris, the world tells you that if you do whatever you want to do, that you're going to experience the fullness of life. But the fullness of life only comes from the presence of God. And it doesn't take a, a PhD to look around the world and to see that the people that are getting everything that their hearts desires are not satisfied. So my question is, God, why do I continue to convince myself that I'm going to be the one exception to the rule amongst billions of people and say that if I just get this thing or just get this promotion or just take this next step in life, then I'm going to be satisfied. And God said, you are only going to be satisfied if you learn how to get into my presence. Otherwise, you will spend your entire life waiting for the next season. That's one of the worst ways to live life. Is always waiting for that next season because it's going to satisfy. What that means is you're going to live a life that is not satisfied. We can only be satisfied in the presence of God. And Thanksgiving, what Thanksgiving does is it enters us into the presence of God. Every single Sunday, and not just on Sundays, but every single morning, every single time that I spend with God, there's a reason why, why Jesus, when he told us to pray, he said, our Father in heaven, addressing God, hallowed be thy name. Before anything else, Thanksgiving and praise precedes petitions. And God said, if we would learn how to how to enter into his gates with thanksgiving, 
that we would be able to enter into his presence. See, the difficulty that some of us face is that when we worship God, some of us are not interested in worshiping God until he answers everything that we need. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, God's not going to budge. Because what, what you're in right now is a power struggle. Who is God in your life? I'm going to just make it super plain right now. If you are waiting for God to answer your prayers until you come to him, that means that your allegiance to him is conditional on him serving you. He is not your God. And that's what I'm working on is that I come to God and say, God, even though I have all these things in my life that haven't been answered yet, and it's so easy to say, well, God, these things aren't happening because they're real, they hurt, they're painful, I'm confused, I don't know. But I say, God, I'm going to enter into your gates with thanksgiving because thanksgiving gives us access to God's presence. It gives us access to God's presence. There was a a picture that I saw pop up of um, a man, some of you may know him, some of you uh, you may need to, just kidding, everyone's going to know him, John F. Ken- Kennedy. Um, someone asked me that the other day, like, do you know him? Are you too young for that? And I was like, no, I know, I know JFK. Um, but uh, this is a president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Have you all seen this picture before? It's, it's a really amazing picture. And the reason is, is because he's in a meeting with some of the top um, executives in his committee. He's meeting with really the most important, powerful people, arguably in the entire world, because this is the president of the United States, Right? The Oval Office, which is where they are, is the office of the president. There are very few people that can get into that area, right? And yet, there's this interesting part that looks like it's Photoshop, but they didn't have Photoshop back then. There is a little child underneath the desk that seems to just be playing around, hanging out in a casual room with his dad, because it's JFK's son, even though it's the Oval Office. And you have all of these people that are the most, like, super, super small group of people that could get into this office, and yet there is a tiny little boy that I don't think is contributing to the conversation, and yet he has the availability and the access into that room. Why? Because of his relationship with the Father. When we begin to understand our relationship with God, that we are children of God, and when we begin to thank God for that relationship, it gives us access into the throne room of God. That's the whole reason why we're doing, why, why, why we spend time worshiping God, is to get into the presence of God. And God said that, that, that what a lot of us haven't understood is our relationship to God. Ephesians says that we can approach God with boldness and confidence because of the blood of Jesus. Because through the blood of Jesus, we have been adopted into the family of God. That means that everything God has belongs to us. I'm going to say it again. Everything God has belongs to us. Think about this. I think about this like the throne room. That you got JFK as God. All the executives are the angels. And when you begin to thank God and you begin to enter into the throne room, you get access to angels that God has. Do you know that Jesus said that he could have called down a legion of angels? Because God loved him because he was the son of God. And now we get the same ability to say, God, through thanksgiving, I'm going to acknowledge that I'm not an enemy to you anymore. I'm not even just a friend. I'm a child. And as a child, I get to come to you with boldness. I get to get access to places that I have no business getting access to. But this is the power of thanksgiving, as the psalmist says, that we would enter into his presence with thanksgiving. And actually, I would say this, is that the absence of thanksgiving... The absence of thanksgiving points to a spiritual problem. Can I tell you what picture came into my head this week? All right. You all are like, he's going to do it anyway. I asked for another picture. I'm not going to show you it. You're going to figure out in a second why I'm not going to show you it. I'm going to tell you it. Um, But uh, did you guys know that uh, when you go into a hospital and get surgery, nurses, you can check me on this one. I got the nurses in the corner. I got multiple. Um, that, that when you go into surgery, you get put under anesthesia. When you come back up, there are a couple things that they're waiting for your body to do before they release you, right? One of those things is what? Pass gas. This is why I told you I wasn't going to show you. There are things that they, that they wait for, and they say, well, before we can, you know, send you out, you need to be able to pass gas. Because the absence of being able to pass gas, do you all know what I'm talking about when I say pass gas? They're not passing canisters of gas. 
do, Mitch, do you want to come up and explain to all of us what? Okay. Um, they're waiting for that because a lot of times when you get put under, that it stops your GI tract, and they need to be able to see and make sure that, that that's moving again. Because if it's not, if you're not able to pass gas, it points to something underneath that they can't see that is an issue. In other words, you're blocked up. Someone say blocked up. What the Holy Spirit showed me, this was the picture he gave me. I can't, I can't choose. But he said that the absence of thankfulness, in the same way that if you're not passing gas, it points to something that's blocked up in your physical body, the absence of thankfulness points to something in your spiritual life that is blocked up. If you are unwilling to give thanks to God, there's something wrong going on. That as a spiritual physician, if you will, God being the spiritual physician, that if, if there's something that hinders you from giving thanks to God, it's pointing to something going on underneath the surface that is an issue that we need to address. Because what I've learned is what thanksgiving does, because there's all these things in my life that I'm struggling and wrestling with and things that haven't happened yet, God says even with all of that, you being willing to give thanks is saying, God, I'm not giving you thanks for these things, but what I'm saying is I'm saying, God, I know that you are the provider and I give you thanks for the things that you have done because I will not allow my worship and my praise to be contingent on the things that have not happened yet. And so many times if, when we struggle with thanksgiving, it's pointing to something underneath the surface that is wrong. It's blocked up. And God says the very first thing that giving thanks does is giving thanks gives us access to God. Let's go on to, to number two. Uh, we'll say in the New Testament, John chapter 6. You can turn to John chapter 6. I want to show you something that the Lord really has highlighted for me, which I think is really amazing that I hadn't seen yet. John chapter 6, we have a scripture where Jesus is, is feeding the 5,000. Y'all heard of this scripture before? So Jesus is about to feed 5,000 plus people, um, 5,000 men. I love it how some people are like, well, it was more than 5,000. Like, it was, that wasn't just, as if 5,000 wasn't like, oh my gosh, it was 7,000. Anyway. Um, 5,000 plus, John 6, verse 5, it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? So I want to just give us a picture here. John is writing this intentionally. He's giving us details and saying that there were 5,000 people and Jesus says, let's give them something to eat. And the disciples are sitting there saying, we don't have enough food. And then he, in verse 9, he says that they have five small barley loaves. Again, if they were normal-sized barley loaves, everything would be fine. But it's five small barley loaves and, five, and what? And two small, again, not normal, small fish. The author is trying to paint the picture for us that they are sitting in a situation where they feel like they do not have enough. There are times in our lives where you may be standing in front of a situation. It's probably not feeding 5,000 people unless you had a crazy Thanksgiving. But it may be that you're standing in a situation where you don't feel like you have enough faith. Where you don't feel like you have enough strength where you've been fighting and fighting and fighting and you're weary and you're tired and you're saying, God, I don't have enough. This is the situation that they're in, that they do not feel like that they have enough. They actually do not have enough. And they're saying, I don't know how we're going to... In other words, it was an impossible situation. That's why they added in the small loaves and the small fish. It's because there is this huge thing happening in front of them, and what they have is not enough. And then in verse 10, Jesus says this, have the people sit down. See, the disciples are panicking, and Jesus is, can't believe I'm going to say it, cool as a cucumber. 
there are some people right now that you are panicking over a situation in your life because you don't know what God's going to do, but God already knows how it works out. That I've, I just, I hear the Holy Spirit tell me right now, he said that I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Even though you don't know what's going to happen, God knows exactly what's going to happen. The disciples were terrified. They were like, how are we going to do this? And Jesus says, just, just tell them to sit down. Have the people sit down. Verse 10, there were plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Now, this is so significant because Jesus has everyone sit down. He's hold, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is holding not enough. He is holding the five loaves and the two fishes. That is not enough. And what does he do? The miracle's about to happen, but the bridge between not enough and having abundance was Jesus giving thanks to God. The Bible says that he took what was not enough, he gave thanks to God and said, God, I thank you for not enough. I thank you that even though this is all that I have, I know that you are the provider. I know that you are the one that, that commands all things. Everything belongs to you. And the Bible says that he gave thanks. And after giving thanks, he distributed the bread and there was more than enough. God is calling some of us in our moments of not enough to say, I want you to give thanks in all circumstances. In all circumstances, give thanks even when you don't feel like you have enough. This is a part of maturing in Christ. This is a part where God is calling you to mature in Christ and say you're not ignoring the situation. You're not saying, oh, I'm just going to forget that it's not there. It's saying, God, even though I feel like that I do not have enough, I am going to thank you because of your faithfulness. God is calling some of you and saying it's time to step out in thankfulness even though this thing hasn't been answered yet. But the door, and this is the second part, giving thanks is the door for miracles. Giving thanks thanks is the door that brings us into a space of miracles. There's been times where I'm praying for a sickness. I'm praying for someone that, that, that's experiencing bodily sickness. I've had this and I'm praying and I'm, I'm praying and I'm rebuking, you know, if it's a, a spirit in there or whatever it may be and just nothing's happening and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just nudges me and says, start just giving thanks to God. Start giving thanks to God. And as I give thanks to God, what I'm doing is I'm declaring, God, you are faithful. You are holy, God. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your anointing. And as I start to thank God, I've seen people get healed just by the power of thanksgiving. Just by the power. Because when I'm thanking God, I'm declaring and I'm immersing whatever the situation is in his grace. And in his mercy and in his power, I'm declaring that he alone is able to heal. And so the second thing, giving thanks opened the doors for miracles. It opens the doors for miracles. I want us to go a couple chapters later. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Flip a couple pages. We're going to start in verse 41. This is another scenario because I want to show you the theme we see in Scripture. John chapter 11. The Bible says that there was two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they had a brother named Lazarus. And Lazarus got sick. And as he was getting sicker and sicker and sicker, things were getting worse, Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus and said, Jesus, our brother who you love is sick. Come and heal him so he doesn't die. But the Bible says that when Jesus finally arrived, Lazarus was already dead. In other words, Mary and Martha were in this moment where they had believed God for something, and yet God didn't show up the way that they thought he was going to. Some of us, you may be in that situation. It's one thing when you're petitioning God for something that is, if you will, sick. But there's another thing when it crosses the line where you believe it's dead. In other words, there's no coming back from dead. Like healing is like Jesus, it's getting worse, 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 worse. But it comes to a point where it crosses over from it's getting worse to it's already done. Some of you, there are some things in your life that you've stopped asking God for because you believe that it's not just sick, it's dead. It's done. 
I prayed, God didn't show up the way that I thought he was going to, it's done. Whether it's for a child, whether it's for a spouse, whether it's through, for a child, um, that having a child, whether it's through a child that's already been born, whether it's through a job, whether it's through purpose, whether it's through mental health, that you've just conceded to the enemy saying, it's never going to get better. And God paints this picture where Lazarus dies because Jesus wants to show them that, yes, I can heal you, but even when I don't come when you want me to, that's not a problem for me because nothing is too far gone for God. Nothing, God says, yeah, I'm a healer, but I'm also the resurrector. And so Jesus shows up at the, at the tomb of Lazarus, who's already been dead four days. It's significant because uh, the Jewish belief was that someone's spirit hovered over their body for three days. And so there was still a chance. And yet this is why the author writes that it was four days. Because after four days, they're gone. To the point that when Jesus says, roll away the stone, Martha says, no, he's going to smell. In other words, Martha has given up the possibility of a miracle happening. And yet Jesus says, roll away the stone. And the Bible says this. So they took away the stone, verse 41. Then Jesus looked up. And said, Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing there. That they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this. In other words, after he had given thanks. Jesus called in a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. In other words, there was a situation that was dead. Jesus came onto the scene and he lifted up his hands to God and he said, God, I thank you. Even though the situation is dead, I thank you. Is there anyone here this morning that, that trusts God enough to say, God, even if the situation is dead and I believe it's not going to happen anymore, I'm, I'm declaring not that it's dead, but that you can resurrect it in the name of Jesus. There's a power in pulling that thing because there are things in your life that you have not taken out and poured the balm, the anointing of thanksgiving over that situation. And until you pull that thing out of that tomb, it's going to continue to have influence on your relationship with God. Because when I bring that thing and I give thanks in all circumstances, someone say all circumstances, when I give thanks in all circumstances, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying, God, I'm pouring your anointed oil over this situation, over this depression, over this anxiety, over this, this demonic presence that I feel, the spirit of heaviness, over this fractured relationship. God, I'm thanking you, not for the addiction, God. I'm thanking you, God, because you are stronger than any addiction. I'm thanking you, God, because you're stronger than any depression. I'm thanking you, God, because the Bible says that in your presence is the fullness of joy. Giving thanks opens the door for miracles. Jesus did it with the 5,000, and he did it with Lazarus. He gave thanks. Someone needs to give thanks over a situation in your life that you think is too far gone. I don't know what the situation is. And I'm, 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 I'm guessing you're probably not going to tell me. And I'm also guessing that all you're going to sit there like there's zero situations in your life. But whatever the Lazarus is that you've maybe even stopped allowing yourself to even think about. Because a lot of us, we shut doors on things because it's easier not to feel than to feel the pain. And yet God says that I want every single part of your heart, you to give it to me. And when you put it in the hands of the Father, and when you give thanks, God takes what is broken, God takes what is dead, and he brings it back to life. But it's saying, God, I will give you thanks. Paul said, give thanks in all circumstances. The last part of giving thanks that I want to talk about is this. I'm going to give you it before the scripture. Giving thanks is the path to mental stability. Living in an age of anxiety, and it's, a, it's, it's an age we've created, 
But living in an age where there are so many things going on that we can be anxious for. So many things that we can be worried about. Some of us spend a majority of our waking hours worrying about what's going to happen. Worrying about this, worrying about that. And if you're anything like me, I've learned that it is no way to live life. That worrying doesn't actually change anything. It's almost like Jesus was on to something when he said, you can't add an hour to your life by worrying, so just focus on today. But giving thanks is a tool for some of you that have been struggling with mental health. This is a tool. I know that you just want to be prayed for. And you just want God to take it all away because that would require absolutely zero participation on our part. But sometimes God says that I need you to learn how to manage that mental health. I need you to learn how to manage it. And by doing that, you need to get into my presence. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Look at the parallels between Philippians and, Thess- and Thessalonians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Help me, Holy Spirit. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, someone say, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Verse 7. And then... This is the product of that. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love the, the word used, guard your heart. I don't know about you, I need, I need a whole legion of angels around my mind sometimes. I need, I, need, I need a fortress around my mind from all the fiery darts from the enemy. And God says that if you give thanks to him... Still bring your petitions, because God wants you to bring your petitions, but bring your petitions clothed in thanksgiving. Bring them in thanksgiving, and when you do that, then the peace of God. A lot of us, we just bring petitions and then say, why don't I feel peace? God said, you forgot one of the most important ingredients. It's a posture of thanksgiving. Not because thanksgiving, just saying, oh, thanks God. Like that's not, it's not this, this tool that we use to manipulate God to doing things. But Thanksgiving is a posture because I cannot hold on to control as I'm giving thanks, Thanksgiving to God. Because there's a petition that I'm believing God for breakthrough in this area. I'm believing God, and right now I'm believing God for salvation in a particular person's life. I have them in my mind's eye. You have your situation in your mind's eye. I brought them into my mind's eye. I'm going to say hello to them in my mind's eye. I'm not going to say who they are. But I'm believing God for something that hasn't happened yet. And with all of the swirling thoughts of doubt, of saying, why hasn't God does it, done it yet? Why isn't this getting better? I'm going to present that situation, that petition, with thanksgiving and say, God, I thank you, Lord, that the Bible says that you draw all people to yourself. I thank you, God, that the Bible says that you can change our hearts in a single moment, God. I thank you, God, that even though I want this person to get saved, God, you want them to get saved even more. And I begin to give thanks to God. And what that does, it's not a magic switch or anything, but what it does is it reminds me that God is in control. We do not experience peace because you are trying to control your life. I'm going to be, and I'm just going to talk, I'm going to talk to myself quick. Don't worry, because you guys are all looking at me sideways. Mitch, let's talk to ourselves. A lot of my anxiety comes because I'm not trusting God. Yes, anxiety can be, you can be predisposed to anxiety. You can have a chemical imbalance for certain things, but a lot of the worries that I have in my life is because I am not trusting that God is in control. I say, yes, God, I love you, but God, I need to hold on to everything, and I'm terrified because deep down we all know we don't have control. But yet God said when you present your petitions to me with thanksgiving, 
What you're doing is you're humbling yourself before God and saying, God, even though there's a petition, I'm thanking you for your faithfulness. I'm thanking you for your power. I'm thanking you for your redemption that you give us. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. And as I begin to thank God, I let go of the control. And this is the peace that surpasses all understanding. Part of the peace that surpasses all understanding is that it, it's peace that comes when you give up understanding. For some of us that are waiting to get peace until you understand everything, you ain't going to get it. You're going to spend your entire life being worried about everything because we are not willing to let go and say, God, I'm asking for peace that surpasses understanding. That means that, God, I'm going to worship you even when I don't understand it. That means, God, I'm going to read your word even when I don't understand what's going on. Why is it? It's because I trust who God is. When, I, when my worship and my thanksgiving is contingent on what God is doing in my life, it means that I yet do not understand the character of God. And yet God says when you give thanks and you learn how to bring your petitions to God with thanksgiving... The peace of God that surpasses all understanding is going to guard your mind and your heart. My mind is going to be guarded because I'm trusting that God is in control. And I don't know about you, but I need to verbally, because I'm not talking about just, oh, I have a grateful heart. I'm talking about verbally giving thanks to God. Did you know in the Bible it was so important in Nehemiah chapter 12 as they were reestablishing the, the wall, as they were reestablishing the city, as they were building up the this, this city in Nehemiah chapter 12, they literally appointed groups of choirs of thanksgiving. And that was their entire job. It was like, hey, what's your job? What do you do for work? I, I give thanks to God. No, 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 but like what do you do for work? No, like that's literally all I do is I give thanks to God. And this started all the way back with King David as they would, they, would, they would hire people to just give thanks day and night because they were cultivating a heart posture of gratitude and thankfulness because they knew as they gave God thanks because what you're doing when you give God thanks, you're giving him glory. And as you give God thanks, it takes the weight of the entire world off your shoulders. Some of you have been carrying the weight of the entire world on your shoulders. And you're weary and you're tired. And so when I say that in the presence of God is the fullness of joy, you say to yourself, I haven't felt joy in years. I'm heavy, I'm tired, things are out of control, there's all these things going on in my life. And God said, if you would take those things and fix your eyes on me and give me thanks for all the things that I have done. Because God says, if you do that, trust me, all the things that you're petitioning me for, I know they're still there. I don't need to remind God of all the things that are going on that I'm still praying for. God says, I wanna hear your petitions. But Chris, you need to learn how to pick up the weapon of giving thanks, not just for the good things, but giving thanks for who God is. It's not conditional on God answering my prayers. It's, it's simply because I know the character of God and I take anything that is not of God and I submerse it into the thanksgiving of God. I sanitize things from my broken perspective and I say, God, wash it in the blood of Jesus. I give thanks to you, God, because you are holy. I give thanks to you, God, because you are worthy. I give thanks to you, God, because you are the one that provides for me. It's the supernatural power of giving thanks. Because giving thanks, it number one, hallelujah, giving thanks, number one, it gives us access into the presence of God. Number two, giving thanks opens the door for miracles. I believe a miracle is going to happen this week as you give thanks to God. That loved one that you feel like has been falling further and further away, as you give thanks for God for being the good, good father, 
I believe that God's going to start turning that thing around because God's going to remind you and say, hey, you don't need to be worried about them because as much as you love your son and your daughter, I love them even more. And then as you give thanks to God, thank you, Father. peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You can stand on your feet. We're going to be done with this. I want to pray that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that it would guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Let's open our hands this morning. Father, I thank you for the power of giving thanks, Lord. I thank you for the supernatural power of giving thanks, Lord. God, for any person underneath the sound of my voice, God, that the enemy has tried to push down and take away the flame that they have for you, God. I see dry bones in my mind right now, Lord. I see the dry bones, Lord, where you, where you took the prophet and you, you showed him all the dry bones and you said, prophesy to the dry bones that they would live again. Prophesy that the wind, that the breath of God would breathe life into the dry bones. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that through the supernatural power of giving thanks, not because we understand the situations, not because the feeling is there, not even because we're, we're feeling grateful, we're giving you thanks because of your holiness. We're giving you thanks because of your glory. We're giving you thanks because you deserve it, Lord. We're giving you thanks because we believe that the blood of Jesus covers every single situation. I pray that someone would have the courage this week to give thanks to you in the middle of not enough. Giving thanks to you even as Lazarus is in the tomb, Lord. Not after he comes out, but before he comes out. And saying, God, I give you thanks because you are stronger than this fear. I give you thanks because perfect love casts out fear, Lord. In other words, I don't need to be afraid because of God's perfect love. God, for the areas in my heart and my life, God, that I have not allowed thankfulness to cover, Lord, I pray that I would take those petitions I would bring those petitions and I would dunk them, Lord. I would dunk them in thankfulness. Not because I'm thankful for those things, because there's so much pain and hurt and confusion. I'm not saying that I'm thankful for them, God, but I'm thankful in them, God, because I know that Romans 8.28 says that God will take anything that the enemy tried to make anything the enemy is trying to use and God by immersing it in thankfulness I'm taking it out of the hands of the enemy and I'm putting it in the hands of the father and saying God you work all things for the good of those who love you and so God I'm giving you thanks because you work all those things Lord you work all of them father and I give you thanks for it Lord father please cultivate a heart of giving thanks, Lord. I pray that this would be a part of our witness. That there's somebody in your life right now that by you giving thanks to God, even while you're going through what you're going through, it will witness to them that there is someone on the inside of you that is different than the rest of the world. And someone will ask you, why are you still giving thanks to God? Why are you giving thanks even with X going on? And that you will have an opportunity to witness and say, I'm giving thanks because I serve a God that is in control. Father, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for the access to your presence. Thank you for the power of giving thanks, Lord. Pray that someone would pick up that weapon this week and say, I'm no longer going to allow those things to hide in the, in the corner in the dark. I'm going to drag them out into the light of your presence, and I'm going to give you thanks in all circumstances, Lord. We thank you, for this is the will that you have for us in Christ Jesus. We love you.
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And amen and amen and amen. Amen, Father. As you all still have your hands open, I'm going to give us the benediction, the blessing over us. After this blessing, I'll be over here. Marissa will be over here. We'd love to pray for you. If you want prayer for anything, the Bible says that if two people would come into agreement, that it would be done for us. Otherwise, we, we come into this blessing with a posture of thanksgiving. I pray that the Lord would bless you, and I pray that the Lord would keep you. I pray that the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Y'all are dismissed. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.